Vielen herzlichen Dank für Ihr Kommen. Es freut mich. Ich, ich möchte mich zuerst bei Professor Herzig bedanken, dass er mich für diesen Preis vorgeschlagen hat und bei der Professor Werner Petersen Stiftung, dass ich diese große Auszeichnung erhalten darf. Erhalten darf. <lacht> ich, <lacht> ich möchte mich auch äh, Professor Bernd für diese großartige Einleitung bedanken und dafür, dass er mir Kiel und Norddeutschland gezeigt hat. Ich habe die letzten sechs Wochen die wunderschöne Küste von Kiel genossen. Hier am Geomar äh, war es wirklich eins der besten Oceanforschungsinstitut der Welt ist, hatte ich intensive und spannende Diskussionen mit vielen alten und neuen Kollegen. Leider ist mein Deutsch etwas hopperig, obwohl ich es mehrere Jahre in der Highschool und am College hatte. Deshalb werde ich meine Präsentation auf Englisch halten. Sie ich hoffe, Sie entschuldigen das. So, I will uh, try to keep the, uh, the English a little bit on the slow side, so you can understand a little better. Um, I also should apologize for this uh, title, which I gave them months ago uh, before putting this together. Uh, what, what I really am going to talk about is trying to understand what we call the, the seismogenic zone, and I'm going to talk about the lessons that we've learned along the way, and uh, also some of the surprises. And uh, although I have my name up here, uh, this is really an international effort uh, by more than 200 scientists, several of whom are sitting in the audience here, so I need to be a little careful what I say. Uh, first, um, probably everyone knows that earthquakes are the, uh, the things that define where the boundaries of the major plates are. Um, the very, very largest earthquakes, magnitude greater than 8.5, only happen in, the, uh, in what we call the subduction zones, where one plate slides beneath another one. So here is uh, an example. The oceanic lithosphere is uh, sliding underneath uh, a continent or a, uh, a volcanic region with a uh, deep sea or deep ocean trench. We call this, again, the subduction zone that has many different uh, earthquakes along it. Um, the largest of the earthquakes, again, are generated in the seismogenic zone, which is this shallow portion up here. So this is what we have been trying to study, trying to understand why these earthquakes occur and, uh, and what is, uh, is uh, leading to large um, tsunamis that happen associated with them. So the seismogenic zone has uh, both a seaward part this is the oceanic trench um, here, the plate sliding underneath. Uh, we have an aseismic zone, a zone that generates earthquakes, and then a uh, place that uh, the plate is just uh, sliding underneath without having large earthquakes. Uh, what we have found over the years is in order to generate large earthquakes, the two plates have to become locked together and then the slip happens all at once. I'll show you a, a quick animation here uh, about how this, uh, how this works. The oceanic plate is uh, sliding down and suddenly it becomes locked. As it becomes locked, it uh, has a lot of uh, stress associated with it. The, uh, the, the compressive stresses are suddenly released in an earthquake um, one area is coming up, and during the earthquake, it suddenly goes down. The earthquake comes, uh, sends earthquake waves, but also the big uh, four region that's, uh, that's moving very fast is what generates tsunamis, kind of like what happens when you uh, are in the swimming pool and you push your hand forward, a big wave goes across. 
we end up with a, a large tsunami like in the uh, Tohoku earthquake back in March of 2011. Um, so again, the area that we are trying to study and understand is this zone where the earthquakes are really occurring. Um, a couple of uh, what we would call challenges, that is, um, things that we really need to understand, uh, a couple of the more important ones are what governs subduction zone fault locking versus stable slip. So what is it about the area here where the two plates become locked together versus being able to, to slide uh, along without too much difficulty? Um, and also, what governs the tsunami generation for any given earthquake? We know that there can be large earthquakes that don't have tsunamis. So why do we have uh, a, a tsunami versus not? Um, so we had a workshop um, over on Big Island of Hawaii. I believe it was something like about 1997, where we uh, invited people from around the world, and we wanted to decide where should we study these seismogenic zones? Where is the best place? Um, these dots represent the places where there have been um, very large and damaging earthquakes, so obviously all of those are possible. Um, Sumatra would, be, would have been one place. Uh, the, the Japanese, uh, the Japan Trench, Nankai Trough, uh, these were the ones that were at the top of the list. Um, other areas, there was a large group of people that wanted to work in the Cascadia zone of, uh, of the, the uh, Pacific Northwest. Uh, there was already a group led by uh, uh, Roland von Heuen at the time, who was here in Guayamar, who was already studying uh, Costa Rica, so he said, we don't need to go there. Um, Chile was another place where the Guayamar group and others were working, so we decided to stay over in the Western Pacific. So first of all, we said, um, we don't need to go to Sumatra. Um, when I was a, a graduate student, we, I was working on a little island offshore here. Uh, we took a seismograph with us, set it up, and there were no earthquakes that occurred. So we said, the reason for this is because it's just passively sliding. So that's not a good candidate. We want a place that's going to generate large earthquakes. Um, the Tohoku area has had big earthquakes, but we knew, based on past earthquakes, that there's never been more than one that's gotten up to maybe seven and a half, maybe eight. Um, so this isn't a good place to study either. So we decided to go to the Nankai Trough, and there were many reasons for doing that. Um, first of all, uh, the Japanese have been uh, very good record keepers for 2,000 years. So we know that about every 150 years, there's been a very, very large earthquake somewhere in the, the Nankai Trough. And it has um, different zones that at various times in the past have been strongly locked, and then they have uh, a large earthquake. Um, Work that we had done all along here in the, uh, in the 80s and 90s showed that uh, we can make a very good seismic image of, uh, of this area. Uh, we can see faults, we can see very good drilling targets, um, so it's a good place to go with this new Japanese drill ship. Um, the, and of course, the, the shallow part of the seismogenic zone was within re reach. The, 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 uh, the depth was not too great for this new Japanese drilling ship. And because we wanted to put monitoring equipment into the holes, it was important to be close to Japan where, where uh, the, we could do the studies. So, the first thing that happened, um, before we could even get started, in 2004, there was a big earthquake in Sumatra. Oops. Um, it wasn't passively sliding after all, it was very strongly locked. Um, big tsunami, you, you all heard about this. Uh, um, Professor Hydran Kopp was already working in this area. Um, I'm sure she told us you should be, this is where you really want to go, but we didn't listen, so. Um, but, uh, so what happened there, um, Sumatra is also segmented like Nankai, 
they actually had a series uh, uh, in the, that have been documented now. There was an earthquake that started here and broke multiple segments all at the same time. So this is uh, yet another lesson that we, that we learn. Number one, it's, it's locked or it has been locked. And number two, multiple segments can break all at the same time. Um, anyway, we were already committed to going to Nankai because we know that that's the place where the next big earthquake is going to happen. Um, the, the Philippine Sea Plate, bounded by the Philippines down here, Taiwan, um, Japan, uh, the, the Mariana region, this plate is subducting to the north underneath Japan about four and a half centimeters every year. Um, the first thing that we did in April and May of 2006, we chartered a uh, vessel from a company called PGS, Petroleum Geoservices, uh, to, to collect, a, uh, a, as Christian said earlier, uh, the first fully funded by uh, academic money uh, 3D seismic survey in the offshore area. Um, this is... Uh, topographic map made by uh, multi-beam echo sounders, not really important what, what everything means, but uh, these different colors with hatchers on them uh, up here and here are, are various faults that we uh, um, have been mapping. And our survey came down all the way from the, uh, what we call a four arc basin across the, uh, what we also call accretionary prism and into the trench area. Uh, this is a, a little animation here. Hopefully it will, whoops, need to find, there we go. Um, so you can see on the surface quite rough topography, uh, very strong indication of uh, folding in this direction and here. Uh, on the, the side of this cube of seismic data, we image the sediments in the basin, the ocean crust, and various other, uh, other bits and pieces of the system. This is a, another look on the side of this. Uh, at the bottom, here we have the ocean crust, which is in this picture descending off to your right. Um, in front of this region, we have a place where the sediment is being crumpled up in front of the advancing plate, uh, forming what we term the accretionary prism. And then we have a big fault that comes up through here that cuts across everything that we've called a mega splay fault. All this terminology is uh, not too important at the moment, um, just for those of us who spend our lives working on it. Um, we also, because of being able to work with this 3D data cube, we're able to do things like uh, um, interpret horizons, such as our mega splay fault, look at the amplitudes, the seismic amplitudes on there, and see patterns. The red patterns are zones that are uh, positive or, or strong uh, velocity, positive velocity contrasts, and the, uh, the yellows are more negative. So we now think that these are, are probably zones where, where the uh, plate boundary is, uh, is stuck or, uh, or locked. Um, we can see the sediments in the basin, um, all kinds of different structures in there. So we then started our drilling program in 2006, end of 2006. Um, these are the sites that we've drilled all the way from a little feature on the, uh, the outside. Remember the Philippine Sea Plate is sliding to the north in this direction, rumpling up the sediment in front of it. Um, so we have a couple sites that we call reference sites, looking at the sediment that's going in, um, right down at the toe of the slope, uh, a little bit higher where our mega splay fault comes up to the surface, and then a couple sites in the basin. Um, this is about where we were, drilled a few sites, really ready to start interpreting this, and then we got our second surprise. Um, 2011, there was a big earthquake in Tohoku, the place where we said that place never has magnitude 9 earthquakes, but it did, so there's another oops. Um, uh, but we did learn 
from this, and it helped us a lot with our interpretation in Nankai. Um, again, there was a, a very large tsunami in this place. Um, before that earthquake happened, we had an idea. We knew how this subduction zone operates. It uh, every once in a while gets slightly locked. So again, took a huge amount of water and shoved it forward, and that's what caused the big tsunami that, that hit Japan. So here's another lesson that we learned along the way. Uh, again, looking at our, at our drill sites, um, want to show you a seismic line that goes from the basin through, basically through all of the drill sites out into the, uh, the offshore area. Uh, this strong reflection here is the top of the oceanic crust coming in, being imaged uh, all the way down, depth of uh, 12 or 13 kilometers uh, below the, the uh, sea surface. An interpretation here showing um, our mega splay fault that comes here uh, goes all the way out to the, uh, to the toe of the slope. Uh, number of uh, splays that come off of that. And then we, uh, I'm showing you all of our drill sites here from the ones outboard uh, right at the toe of the slope and all the way up. Uh, the first thing that we want to do is look at uh, because I'm sort of limited on, uh, on the number of things that I can talk to you about today, I'm picking only a few of them. Um, if we look at the frontal region and the very shallow part of our splay fault coming up here through the system, coming up this way, so this entire part of, the, uh, of uh, Japan is sliding down to the south over the Philippine Sea Plate. Um, so we, after drilling holes here and here, uh, doing a lot of work, a uh, number of people spent a, a lot of hours in the, uh, in the lab analyzing samples, uh, we're able to find that both along the frontal thrust and along this splay fault system, there's evidence that the slip during various earthquakes is localized into very, very narrow fault zones, very much like what we saw in Tohoku. So let's take a look at a couple details of our seismic data, one down at the toe of the slope and one up here in the uh, um, frontal thrust or the, the uh, splay fault area. Um, first of all, looking here, this piece is, uh, is overriding. It has moved about two kilometers seaward overriding this sediment, and we drilled a hole that goes right through the fault. That was one of our uh, big accomplishments. Down at the toe, we found that the, uh, the slip along that fault, bringing this piece from way down here, about eight kilometers down, it has moved, again, up about eight kilometers. A drill hole through that fault, um, again, shows the details of movement during earthquakes. Um, possible frictional shear heating all the way down to the toe, uh, localized and distinct slip surfaces all through the data, or all through the, uh, through the cores. So here are a couple of, uh, of photographs of the cores. This one from uh, the toe of the slope, the plate boundary thrust, and this one is from the, uh, from the big what we call mega splay fault, and both of them you see zones of fault gouge, um, fragmented fault gouge, uh, very localized shearing indicating that this is where the fault zone was moving, and it, 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 uh, we think that it happened during major earthquakes. Why do we think that? Well, the people who um, worry about how, um, how faults move, um, studied these two cores, um, one in the mega splay fault, one at the plate boundary, and, and discovered a number of really interesting things. First of all, um, they could define almost exactly where that fault is. Based on uh, studying microfossils, this part of the system is Pliocene in age, 
and underneath it is Pleistocene. So we've taken younger, or excuse me, older rocks that are deeper in the system and brought them up over the top of younger rocks right along this surface. Um, this is where you can see the localization of the shear. Measuring something called um, vitrinite reflectance, you can see right in this area there is a slight bump indicating that the little fragments, the dark fragments of, uh, of organic material have been heated up more than those around them. Um, remember that uh, there haven't been very many earthquakes here in the recent past, um, so this happened uh, at a minimum of uh, about, uh, I guess the last one was 1946, so 60 or 70 years ago. Um, so to still have a signal of this heating really indicates that there was, there was uh, friction along that boundary. Same thing over here, we can find where that boundary is. We find older rocks on top of younger rocks and the same sort of signature. Uh, one of the things that uh, we are able to do these days on the uh, Japanese drill ship, the Chikyu, they have a uh, um, a medical uh, CAT scan system, XCT, uh, rather than sending people through it, you send a core through it and it, uh, it, it makes you a, a very nice image. Um, down here is representation of looking down on top of the core and this is a plane that is going to move through the core and the core right here, you will be able to see how things are changing. So as we're moving through the core this way, you can see these uh, light colored zones. Those are our uh, shear zones. You can see how things are lining up there. Um, and especially in, in, a, in a couple of seconds, we're going to now rotate this thing around and you can see there's a plane through here and every once in a while when you get in the right orientation, you can look down that plane. Here we're coming up to that. Right there you can see that's where everything is lined up. And this is where these two pieces of the core were shearing across each other um, during an earthquake. Sorry, I want to go to the next one. Um, so probably it's about time to, uh, to talk a little bit about what we've specifically learned from this uh, big Nankai trough seismogenic zone experiment. First of all, uh, certainly we learned lots and lots of basic geology about this area. We know about the, uh, the incoming plate. We've drilled two holes into the oceanic crust. We know what the age of the, uh, the, the basaltic interface is. We, we know what the sediments overlying it are um, the so-called outer wedge, the region that's really being strongly deformed um, in the uh, accretionary prism. We know how old the sediments are when they were, where they've been deposited. Uh, we know when they were accreted, stripped off of the descending plate and added to this accretionary prism. Uh, we know when the thing was deformed. In this older part, the inner wedge, uh, we know now all about the ages of the sediment in the forearc basin, um, and we know we, we've gotten this hole down um, to about 3,000 meters depth. So we know um, how old the sediment was when it was accreted there, and we confirmed that the youngest accretion is going on here. As we get back into this system, the rocks that, are, that were accreted at the trench are getting older and older and older as we go back. Um, but then we should talk a little bit more about what it is in terms of uh, learning about subduction zones in general. Uh, what, what have we learned here? Um, first of all, we've uh, confirmed what we saw in the uh, Tohoku earthquake. This area clearly has uh, the slip along this uh, plate boundary fault has gone all the way out to the trench. In places like Sumatra, people have tried to find evidence that the, the uh, system broke all the way to the trench, but it's been 
not so easy to, uh, to demonstrate that. Uh, we also know that it has in the past slipped um, up one of these uh, branches of the splay fault. So given that this has happened in the past, we should expect that it's going to happen again in the future. Um, both of those uh, processes, slipping all the way to the trench and slipping along the uh, display fault, cause this entire region, which uh, is uh, a long strike, probably uh, 100 kilometers or so, when that breaks all at once and pushes a large amount of water, the people who are living in South Japan are not going to be happy when that big tsunami comes to them. So both of those are things that contribute to the uh, tsunami generation. Um, last month, you may have heard that there was an earthquake that uh, actually the epicenter, that is where it plots on the surface, um, was in a place called Kumamoto. Uh, we were quite lucky, or they were quite lucky, that the depth of this earthquake was quite deep. It was, uh, I think it was 300 kilometers deep. So uh, along that dipping interface, it was back here a ways rather than up shallow. Um, but even that generated quite a lot of shaking in uh, the island of Kyushu. Uh, if it had happened shallower, there would have been a tsunami. But since it was deep, there was no tsunami. But it really um, shook up the Japanese, especially the politicians, who suddenly are energized again, saying, oh my god, there's going to be an earthquake in Nankai. Uh, almost the same time, there was an earthquake that happened fortuitously right in the middle of where we were drilling. It was only a magnitude 6. Um, but in, uh, in one of our drill holes, we had a monitoring system that was in place, um, had a strain meter, had a, uh, a seismometer. And the recording package was just about to be pulled out of the hole. Chikyu was sitting there. It was entered the hole. And all of a sudden, there was this earthquake. So, they decided, we better leave this thing in for another couple of days and see what kind of aftershocks there will be. Um, so it demonstrated the utility of, of having monitoring equipment in the hole. They knew everything about this earthquake almost immediately. So that smaller quake happened right in here. Now, the Japanese themselves, uh, the Japanese Coast Guard, just put out a paper last week that was publicized in the Japan Trench or sorry, Japan Times, uh, 25th of May. So just a few days ago, uh, the, the Japanese Coast Guard put a bunch of uh, seafloor geodetic systems in place, similar to what the Geomar Group has uh, down in Chile at the moment. Um, they've been monitoring it, and they've shown uh, if you look at how much slip is occurring overall in this whole system, versus right at the toe of the slope, clearly it's locked. So it's coming down, pulling down, pulling down, and surely in the next 10 or 15 years, it's going to break, and there will be a big earthquake um, all along here in the Nankai Trough. So um, we are pretty happy that uh, we are now hopefully going to be able to drill uh, all the way down with our final stage, drilling all the way down to this um, plate boundary fault, uh, being able to understand uh, the condition of the rocks uh, both above and below that interface back deeper in the system. We've gone across the interface up here at the toe and shallow up here, but we really need to get down deep into the system to try and understand really the properties along that interface. Um, and we want to put in Again, long-term monitoring equipment. It was this one here that uh, um, actually is in place. It was replaced uh, with a new uh, recording package a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we want to put a shallow one down here at the toe, uh, one deeper one that goes all the way down across this plate boundary interface. So we want to be able to measure um, earthquakes, um, all aspects of the earthquake, the strain, the fluid pressure, temperature in all of these different, uh, different sites. And we hope that uh, by the time we get that done with a few years of, uh, of monitoring before the next earthquake happens, we'll be able to catch these phases as the earthquake 
buildup is occurring and as it, uh, as it occurs. So hopefully over the next few years, we'll, uh, we'll have some pretty spectacular results. Uh, thank you very much for uh, listening today.